Welcome to the Race Guru Thunder Hour, brought to you by the Elite Plus Network and FantasyGuru.com. Hosted today by the one, the only, Sean Angle, the man, the myth, the legend behind the proverbial curtain. You can find on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, at Sean E247. Remember, we keep it nice and short and simple. Four turns at most tracks. Sean's got four letters to his name. S-E-A-N, man. Don't screw it up. You can find me. You like that? You can find me on Twitter, X, (laughs) at Fantasy Bosco, all spelled out. I am Rich Mileto, your one and only loudmouth curmudgeon. Here to join Sean, as always, to talk NASCAR. And Sean, this is a little bit of a goofy week, right? I mean, it's been a while since we've seen a, a – well, first of all, I can't remember the last time we had a two-week break like this for NASCAR, but we haven't yeah. really had an, even a, a mid-summer break in, what, three, four years now? Yeah, usually the last few seasons, there's only been like one off week for the Cup Series every year, yeah. and that's just been about it. I want to say it was like, I think, Father's Day it was. Yeah, I believe Wasn't you're Father's correct, Day? which is weird. I, think, I so. think it was, and it's like, no, no, let's go back to taking off Easter and Mother's Day. Let's go back to taking a midsummer break here. And, you know, Father's Day was always a thing at the track. No big deal, you know. And like you and I talked off air earlier this week, let's stop this nonsense of running into November, man. Yeah, especially competing with football when uh, we know it, as far as American sports go and as far as American sports audiences go, they believe football is king and don't want anything else conflicting. And, you know, I have called into the radio shows back in the day and I have upset some of the folks on even serious NASCAR and, and some of the other things because I've said NASCAR should not be competing with football. It's stupid. The best thing to do – look – we grew up as racers, short tracks. The fall thins out for us racers at the track. We're not real big on being at the track when it's real cold. We're not big on being at the track when it's wet. We race in the fall a little bit, but, you know, beyond September, October, that's about it. Like, you not, you might have some practice, some one-offs, some special races here and there, but that's not the norm. The norm is, you know, we hit it as early as we can in the spring, you know, April, sometime around there as things dry out, right? And, and we go heavy and hard and, until fall. And I don't think they should compete with football, whether it's college or NFL. Football is the national pastime. Anyone wants to argue that with me, I challenge you to go to a bar seven days a week and see how many jerseys you count throughout the week. Then show up on a Sunday and see how many jerseys you count and understand how much people pay for those jerseys. Check the ratings for NFL and football. And the sad thing is, Sean, it's the same core group, right? People that are used to sitting down and watching football on Sunday – probably don't have an issue of sitting down and watching racing during on Sunday during the other times of the year, you know? And I liked your yeah. idea. If we're going to if we're going to start pushing this into the fall, let's do Saturday night, Friday night, Wednesday night. Let's do some midweek stuff. Let, let's quit competing head to head with NFL cuz I got to tell you as as people who work in this industry, right? And and we cover more than one sport and a lot of people do. My hats off to Jeff and Ray and all those guys. I don't know how they compartmentalize the stuff like they do but sean we see it in our discord channel we see it everywhere as football starts the racing fandom wanes i don't know another way to describe it and it's not like we cover any sort of rally racing where they'll race in harsher conditions and that's part of the fun of that for example right rallies kind of and rallies an international thing and and i love rally it's fun to watch but look it's hard to find on tv all the time It's definitely a niche sport um, as far as the fandom goes. I recommend if anyone gets a chance, it's cool to check out. But here again, it's tough to watch. You see literally a small, you're real close, don't get me wrong, but you see a very, 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 very tiny part of the track. And you really kind of travel and camp and go along with it, right? With the like the Baja. I've heard going to the Baja is a great time and I'd like to do that. But you only see so much racing, you know? It's actually more enjoyable to watch per se on TV, but... You look, we don't run NASCAR. You and I were talking about it. I, I would love to get in these board meetings and be like, look, would you guys put your egos out of the way for a minute? Let's be honest about some things. I, You want everybody to make – not everybody's going to turn into a diehard NASCAR race fan. It's not going to happen. And you lose every casual fan you have. Yeah, pretty much. As far as, as it's concerned – We've seen that the midweek races can work. We've seen that doubleheader weekends with two cup races in one weekend can work. The 2020 COVID season showed us that that can work and still put on good shows. So 
I don't see really see why we don't work towards eventually changing in that direction a little more, Rich. I really at, at least at, at least towards the end of summer. And hey, we've been sitting here talking about football. Let's not let's not bury the lead. We got all sorts of football content coming up. Sean, you're working on behind the scene football. Con- I mean, you are as busy as anybody here at fantasyguru.com. Please go over to fantasyguru.com. Check out the subscribe button. There are so many different packages. Um, you got the MVP all in package. I don't even know what that's promo to right now, Sean. Help me out. I, I I know pricing is discounted for right now. Well, as far as the MVP all in package, I believe that's all the other sports except for MLB and football. That's still forty dollars, I believe, and that can for cover you for, for the year, 12 months. There's other packages like the uh all in package, you know, that's 400 bucks usually the mvp platinum get to everything gets including the football including the baseball which fantasy gurus football and baseball content always top notch always worth following i've put in a few baseball lineups over the course of the season and also won some money a little bit here and there too so Dude, I, I, I tell, tell you, you it works and i'm not a regular mlb dfs player the i dabble in it too. every now and again but it helps the bets have been too. MLB model been killing it. Uh, Ted was on a heater for a while. So was Jeff. Uh, so was Chris Rose has been killing it. I understand on the DFS stuff. Um, I think Bonder had some great stuff out there. Patio Joe's been dropping some fire. It's been great. And we got DFS Marlin put, producing more football content again. So he's already getting ahead of the game on both the preseason and college football. I mean, look, football is what drives everything. That's where the whole rant started out with, right? Head over to fantasyguru.com. Check it out. If you are into the all-in and you're hearing misconstrued numbers on the package, reach out to support at fantasyguru.com. But I got to tell you, you need to act now, like literally this week. Um, yes. Pricing will change. Uh, early bird pricing, whatever you want to call it, is hit now. But over the next month, that is going away. So if you want to take advantage and get in while the pricing's hot, this is the time. I stand by our full price or whatever you want to call it, regular price. I still say it's most bang for the buck of what's out there in the industry. I really believe that there is so much football content in our draft guide, man, there's a deal for just the draft guide, but there's so much football content in the draft guide. I challenge anyone to read all of it. You can't, there is so much info. You're not going to be able to. Yeah. And you're even a contributor to some of that info too. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. There's uh, got a couple of different articles. I got to get out this weekend, quite frankly, one of them around some of the betting stuff. I hope to talk about some of the alt line bettings, which I, we don't get alt lines in NASCAR. That'd be kind of fun, right? I mean, hmm, if I could like yeah. turn around and, and buy down, be like, yeah, I don't like his top five odds. How much, you know, what's what's my low top 10 odds? Oh, I can get minus 800 for a top 10. I'll take that and I'll parlay it with something else. But uh, we'll, we'll do that for football. Well, let's, let's get into the reactions, man. It's been a, a week, well, two weeks now, right? Since we were last on the track. Take us through yeah. it, Sean. So really, when it comes to Indianapolis, we had three different races overall, and there was split between two tracks, technically, all within the same zone. You had IRP, Indianapolis Raceway Park, for the truck series. The trucks race at IRP. Ty Majeski, he ended up getting his second consecutive win at the site. He took it away from Christian Eckes after an incredible comeback run based on a penalty for jumping a restart earlier in the race there, Rich. So Ty Majeski getting it done. Yeah. And I don't, I'm still debating how much of a jump that was, but I didn't have the data. I think NASCAR had the data after seeing, we'll get into it later, but after seeing the Larson Blaney data, I know the data exists. I don't know how readily available it's as lifetime, but that is a telltale. After reading that data, it's pretty hard to argue one way or another, if, if if NASCAR has access to that data, I'm, I'm not going to call their bluff, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, as long as they're willing to show and put the data forward when there's still enough doubt, that's proof right there. Pretty much yes. proof. But, but still. I did feel like did feel like I just kind of got the short end of the stick there. That said, we did talk up Majeski a little bit. We said this is a great bounce back. He's been good at short tracks. He was absolutely dominant there. He wasn't necessarily my favorite play because I really wasn't sure how he was going to do, but I, I was very adamant if he's going to win this, the win is coming here. So 
he really put on a show. He went through the field. He was battling Christian Eckes there, and then he pulled away. I mean, Eckes was the only driver that had anything for Majeski there, and he just continues to showcase a strong season finishing second. Infinger gave him a little something-something. I did push That's Infinger, true. and Infinger was right there at the end, and that was kind of my gut shot call. That um, R7 team, I see R7 team, um, they were new this yep. year. They have really started to come on strong here lately. I think Infinger gets a win before the end of the year. I thought he was going to give him a little something there at the end. That was fun to see the end of it. Very disappointing for Heim. But you can't you can't get into you know, here's the thing. I would have hoped that Heim would have learned this last year with the host the Carson Hosovar incident. I don't think he has, Sean. Not fully, definitely not fully there. He's still a very young driver and incidents like that show it bit right there even though Corey heim he ended up having a pretty good car truck overall and uh he was make, making a strategy play in order to maintain a top finish there he ended up fading back to 17th but he still ended up confronting Eckes after the race when clearly i think it was just a racing deal they were racing for the same you know piece of real estate is what it came down to in my opinion um those things are going to happen, and, and I hate to break it to them. Those two gentlemen are probably going to have to start figuring it out because I I don't see either of them getting far away from each other as far as I see both both climbing the ladder. I think we're going to see both in cups sooner than later, so they better start figuring out because I'm with you, Sean. I don't I don't think it was e egregious as I think Heim took it, but here again, you know, Corey LaJoy is still adamant Kyle Busch turned himself and – I have I don't dislike Corey the Joy, but I would tell him to his face, you're an idiot. That's not what happened. Yeah, pretty much. Just hurt feelings right there. Hurt yep. feelings. So Which happens a lot in racing. Yeah, it's it's true. Very much so, especially when you get these younger drivers that don't understand that some things are just racing deals that you just gotta let go because it just happens. Corey Himes gotta like learn that a little bit more. Unlike the dirt race highlight I watched earlier where the guy worked hard to get around him clean, and every time he got around him, the guy, the other guy drove up into him to the point he got him off the track. The second time he got him off the track, it led to a car flipping and was like, what's the problem? I'm sitting here going, you should have your face beat in, dude. That That is just shit-ass driving, and that's, that's racing, man. People get passionate and gnarly, and I don't mind the fisticuffs after a race, bro. I got to tell you, I don't. Oh, I don't mind I it either. I, I get maybe I'm a violent human, but I don't mind it, man. I really don't. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of passion, uh, you heard Rich show a little bit of passion there. Uh, just so you know, we might occasionally get very passionate and say <laughs> words that people Good might call. not be 100 percent comfortable with always hearing. So there's your warning right there. Yeah, you know, yeah, we disclaimer. probably should have said that at the beginning of the show. Yeah. But. The Rich Mileto disclaimer. The filter doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> we aim for it to be more family friendly than not, but we reserve the right to, oops, sorry, it wasn't. So if you have sensitive ears nearby, um, maybe put ear fun, you know, earphones over them or, or something of that nature. Finish up the truck race. Nice Motorsports, kind of a disappointment. We already gave the hat tip to Grand Infinger, who I was, I was bummed it was third. I thought he was going to end up pulling out the second place finish, but hey, he's been getting it done, right? Um, yeah, he's Ross Chastain didn't even get in a top 10. He was 11th. Bailey Curley was 14th. Matt Mills. We both were hoping for more for Mills. He was 22nd. Not overly surprised with Connor Daly 29th, but hey, we'll get to it later. But Connor Daly was all right come Saturday. Yeah, that is for sure. I want to say it's just because he has a little bit more experience in the Xfinity Series car compared to the trucks and just different kind of venue compared to what he's used to because he has raced at Indianapolis before, right. Right. but not it, really IRP as much. Well, I was going to say, you and I kind of highlighted daily because we said that, and we also liked Larson. because High speeds at that track isn't going to be bad seat time, right? And we've talked about this with uh, Carson Guapo and Lane Riggs. Go to the short tracks. We love these guys. You get them on the bigger tracks, it's a little more of a dicey situation. It's not their wheelhouse, right? And that, that just of, goes to show experience matters. Absolutely. And speaking of short track drivers, William Solwich, 
top we, we, place differential play of the week there. Let's get into that real quick. Uh, yeah, William Sawalich, like yeah, he was the top place differential play of the week. He started 26th, ended up finishing 12th, gained 14 positions there, Rich. Yep, and we highlighted him, pushed him in the truck article. That was the name to watch, as was the number two place differential guy. Well, actually, there were two drivers that ended up getting the second most. At 12 positions gained, we first had Lane Riggs, who started 17th and finished 5th. And then the other one was the, one of the drivers we just mentioned. Uh, he may not have had exactly a great finishing day, but he certainly had a good place differential day. And that was Matt Mills starting 34th, finishing 22nd there, Rich. And partly why we liked Mills was we really thought chances are he was going to move up 5 to 10 spots. And he did. Right. So he um, did a little bit more than that. He moved up 12. Right. right. And Lane Riggs, I'm not shocked. I believe I said in the article, I will not be shocked to see a top five finish from Lane Riggs. This is right in his wheelhouse. And it showed. I was a little disappointed with the qualifying run, mostly because I wanted to take a shot on him with lower ownership. If he had qualified, say, in the top 10, he seemed like an easy target qualifying 17th. Um, and I tell you what, Sean, Dean Thompson, I don't know what to do with this guy. Every time I say to play him, he burns me. Every time I fade him, he burns me. I The guy always has speed. He just, he gets over his skis all the time, man. But still, he gained 10 positions within positive place differential, starting from 19th, ended up with a top 10 finish in the ninth position, taking advantage of that Tricon garage equipment that you would regularly expect to see in the top 10 based on how good that equipment usually is. So, And he's always in Tricon, yeah. and he is all over the map. He is constantly a value to look at because the speed is there, and yet it, he just has me. I mean, I put it in the article. I know I, I talk about him every week, and I'm like, he's worth a look. I just I get hesitant of pushing him because when I push him, he bites us. And when I say avoid him, I don't. So um, hit us with the worst of the week. So the worst place differential plays of the week, number one at minus 25 positions was Stuart Friesen. He started he eighth, finishing 33rd. Second yeah. worst was Daniel Dye. He lost 20 positions, starting seventh, finishing 27th. And then Matt Crafton was number three, losing 19 positions, starting from fifth, ending in the 24th position there, Rich. And Die was frustrating because he was running top five, top 10 for almost the entire race. It was a fuel stop and a pit stop challenge that really put him behind the eight ball. Um, that one hurt because it was a good value. It was low ownership. We were going to be really sitting well with him. And Friesen has a good record there. And wow, that... If I remember correctly, he got into he got some damage early on, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Got involved in one of those incidents. Yeah. And Matt Crafton, I've been fading him. I haven't said that outright in the articles, but you will not see me talk about him like I had in the past. So it, we keep seeing this. I, I think we might be looking at the twilight of Matt Crafton's career. Yeah, I certainly think it's looking exactly like the case there. But, you know... The drivers that aren't in the twilight of their careers and still doing well, though, however, are the three drivers that led laps. Christian Eckes led 73. That was the most just over Grant Enfinger, who led 71. And then race winner Ty Majeski ended up leading 56. All three drivers ended up being the top three of the race. So there you go there, Rich. And, you know, I want to give a shout out to Ankrum. I have pushed him at times and he's let us down. I've been very lukewarm on him. I mentioned him as someone to watch this weekend. I don't know that I was really sold he would be a top five finisher, um, but he did. He was fourth. It's only a second top five in the last three races. Um, Sammy Smith, another top 10 in sixth, right? This is only his yep. third truck start, though. Um, and his third top I think, 10? I think they moved him up to Xfinity too fast, man. I, I think we should have seen Sammy Smith in a truck before now, but it is what it is. Hey, Luke Fenhouse. The guy just keeps yeah. getting it done, man. I mean, maybe Thor Sport should consider Matt Crafton, Fenhouse. It's possible, but Fenhouse just got a new career best finish during this weekend uh, of seventh there. It's his second top 10 finish in three starts in the truck level, so good on him. Raja Karuth ended up finishing eighth, another top 10 run for him, as well as Nick Sanchez finishing in the 10th position. Uh, anyone else here that we should highlight, Rich, before we move on to Xfinity? Uh, Chase Purdy. We've been expecting more. He's in the right equipment. It just hasn't come together. He's there with Spire. 
it is very inconsistent. I feel like we're on the cusp, though, of something happening there. He was 13th. Jack Wood was 15th. I, I told everybody the article, he's worth a look. The equipment's there. He's just tough to get a gauge on. Um, and I'm a bit disappointed in Taylor Gray, to be honest with you, Sean. Coming yeah, Taylor Gray with the 16th place finish there. We usually expect a little bit more out of Tricon equipment there. And that was just Especially a little underwhelming. Yeah. Oh, and hat tip to Timmy Hill. He has been a little bit yeah. pricier for our value guys, but we've been pushing him pretty consistently. 19th. I tell you what, Timmy Hill's not a free square per se, but if you have the money and you're not sure what to do with that that punt position, keep him in mind weekly because this is not uncommon. He's been about a top 22 finisher consistently. Yeah, pretty much there. Uh, Johnny Sauter finished 23rd in Hattori Racing Equipment, and Marco Andretti ended up getting a few positions in the, the 25th position there to round it out, Rich. Yep. Well, let's head over to the big track where they have yeah. the yard of bricks. Brickyard. Brickyard. <laughs> All right. So uh, it certainly delivered for the Xfinity Series because we ended up getting one of the best finishes of the year, I'd say. Riley Herbst ended up winning in a thriller against at Eric Almarola, who returned for the first time in months to the Xfinity series and beating out teammate Cole Custer. Stuart Haas Racing ended up going one, two with Herbst and Custer finishing first and second. But man, that was a thriller right there, Rich. I, the I last, really enjoyed that one. The last four race uh, laps of that race was probably the la the best four laps of racing I think we've seen. Oh, I, I know we've had some great cup finishes, but from an actual racing standpoint, we had Amarola about lose it, fight his way up there. He had come back after getting turned sideways earlier in the day. We had the two teammates duking it out. We had strategy coming in that got us to this position. It, there was so much stuff at play with the way the cautions fell and everything else. It was a fantastic show to end the race. It really, I would love to see that type of racing at Indy every time we come here. That, we have not seen it. The Brickyard has not historically put on a great show. That was a fantastic show. Yeah, it really was. And just see, seeing Riley get in there and show that he wanted to win that badly because, you know, he only has one career Xfinity Series win before he got that second win at Indy right there. So it really meant a lot to him. And I'm sure it meant a lot to his overall resume and how teams are viewing it, too. I mean, let's not get it twisted. We know Riley's getting considered for cup rides next year. So there you go. So it's, and, and Custer has one. Yeah. As far as we as far as we understand it, I mean, I, it, it's more or less official. So, um, you know, we might see those two guys racing against each other next year at the, with the big boys, so to speak. Uh, Kalug bounced back. They had a good day. Hey, again, Daniel Die. He just keep, you know, the truck finishes haven't been there, but he keeps getting some quality finishes in the Xfinity series. You know, it kind of makes me laugh. It's like when Jimmy Johnson. He was so not good in Xfinity, but the moment he got into a cup car, he like flourished. Yeah. Joe, Dai has been kind of all over the place in the truck series, but every time he's in an Xfinity car, he's a top 10 guy, it seems like. Yeah, he's actually, I believe that Colleague Racing even tweeted this out too, that within the last three times that Dai has stepped into the Xfinity car, this was his second top 10 run. You're right, so. right. And the other one, he ran in the top 10 before having some problems. I don't remember if it was a pit or tire or what it was, but he was, because I, I remember going, I wasn't expecting you to be up here, but you are. Uh, SVG had a nice, again, not shocked, an open wheel guy. <laughs> I don't know what it is with the open wheel guys and dirt racers. He's a sports car take, guy, not an open well, wheel guy. That's my, not my bad. He's a road <laughs> racer is, is. I always associate the two together. Now. He's a road racer, but I've always said this, the road racers and the dirt guys, for some reason, take to Indy. I don't know. This goes back years, man. I mean, back when you had USAC guys that were jumping up, you know, the Stan Foxes of the world and stuff. I don't know what it is. If it's the flat turns, you know, and, and, and the way they corner then for the road racers or what, but you know, Juan Pablo took to Indy really well as an example. So shout out to him. Dinger, another road racer. He was eighth, and and like you said, if it wasn't for Josh Williams, colleague just would have been a, a really happy because I, I think they were hoping for a top 15 from Josh, and yeah, that did happen. 
Yeah, unfortunately, Josh Williams got involved in a crash pretty early on in the event and just was relegated to 36. But three out of the four call it cars inside the top 10, pretty solid day for them. And especially because I don't think we've even said that often, especially this year, that we've had multiple call it cars in the top 10. Crazy to think, Rich. No, and they, you know, two years ago, they were the class of the field, right? So. Um, hat tip to them. They're, they seem to be turning the corner a little bit. And what's his name? Uh, Rice. Is his last name's Rice. Yeah, the Chris owner, Rice. Right? Chris Rice. I always say, but Doug, because Doug Rice is the former, he just retired, uh, PRN radio guy. Chris Rice admitted, hey, we expanded extra people. We weren't ready for it. We finally have caught our breath and getting our arms around it. It's starting to show up on the track. And truck Series, too. We're, we're seeing that at the Truck Series level, too. So curious if we see it in the cup. A couple of uh, top Place differential plays of the week. Parker Kligerman gained 26 positions. Huge, huge yeah. points there. SVG gained 19 or 19 points after starting 23rd, finishing fourth. And Ryan Sieg, boy, the Sieg brothers, yeah. man, sometimes they're hard to get a vibe on, but they are fun to watch pretty much all the time. Ryan Sieg picked up 16 positions, finishing 11th after starting 28th or 17th positions, I guess, after starting 28th. The worst of the day. Yeah. My, my boy, Sam Mayer, he got caught in an incident, started fourth, finished 37th. That hurts you, obviously. Um, Anthony Al- And Anthony Alfredo was running up front when he got, I mean, he, he was in that top five, top ten for as long, as long as he was on the track before he got caught up in that wreck. He lost 29 points, finishing 34th after starting fifth. And Josh Berry with a massive letdown, starting 10th, finishing 38th. Um, and the sad yeah. thing is all three of those guys were kind of in play at, at some level or shape or form, at least for me. Um, not a good idea. Yeah, that did not end well with those guys. All three of them just did not finish the race. and ended up getting caught in different wrecks. How unfortunate. But there was you a know, lot of wrecks. We got to the uh, stage winners and lap leaders of this race. Uh, Riley Herbst, he ended up winning the first stage as well. And then Ryan Sieg, again, you mentioned it about the Sieg brothers and RSS Racing. Ryan Sieg ended up winning the second stage, which was huge for him because he's also locked into that, that playoff battle in order to get into the final spot on points. And he is pretty close at this point there, Rich. Yeah, he needed that. That was big. And they're getting it done. They're They're starting to play chess with the other guys instead of just checkers, right? That's the thing I'm starting to see from RSS, especially Ryan Sieg. Ryan Sieg has been the best of the RSS teams there, so he got another strong run. Looking good there. Uh, as for lap leaders, we have Cole Custer leading the most at 47, Riley Herbst leading 30, so SHR dominated this race pretty much. Uh, yep. Brandon Jones led 10. Eric Almarola still ended up leading five laps. Ryan Sieg, as mentioned, he led four, and so did A.J. Allmendinger. Yep, that was pretty good. Some top finishes. Sheldon Creed wasn't second, but he was fifth. Still tied for the lead for the most top fives of the year with Cole Custer. So as much as, you know, Creed has let us down and whatnot, this is why we keep saying wins are coming, because you don't, you don't, you're not tied with Custer for top fives and not be good. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not luck. Um, he just but, got more than Austin Hill, who finished one position behind him in sixth. Right, right. And Austin Hill's what, won three races this year? You know? Yeah, he has. Um, yep. Justin Allgaier it was a little disappointing ninth. I think he was hoping for something better. Uh, Carson Guapo, I liked the 10th place finish. I really did. This is a big track. This is a little outside his wheelhouse, so hat tip to Mr. Guapo. Jesse Love bouncing back a little bit with 13th. He ran up front early, kind of had a little bit of a disappointing fish for where he kind of ran. Um, Connor Daly, we mentioned him earlier, thought, you know, hey, the Indy experience helped. He was 14th here. Um, yeah. Chandler Smith, though. Oof, Chandler. 33rd, bro. Not good. Lost um, 20 that positions. Hurt. That was the fourth most on the worst place differential yeah. plays list. Had we expanded that to four, he would have been next in line. Sammy Smith, 18th, not ideal. Um, I had had higher hopes for Leland Honeyman in 20th, and, and Jeff Burton had an okay run there in 19th. Um, tell you what, Sean, I, I know you got some thoughts, so let's talk about the Cup Series. Why don't you lead us off here, bud? All right. Let's just ask this question, Rich. Can we please just have one crown jewel event this year that doesn't end with disappointment or controversy? Just one, Rich? Nope. 
It's NASCAR. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, guess what? I'm going to predict some sort of bullshit controversy at the uh, last race of the year. Oh, yeah. The championship and maybe, mm -hmm. uh, well, we only got one crown jewel left, too. Uh, the Bristol Night Race. So, right. We know how well, the short tracks are. So, I don't know, Rich. I don't know. <laughs> well, Bristol, we already, we already kind of got an interesting taste of Bristol at the day race. So, I don't, you're right. I mean, Maybe maybe Darlington is is has some scuttlebutt, but I I just feel like it's NASCAR, bro. You're just gonna have to suck it up and deal with it. Uh, we shall see. But you know, let's get into Indy here. Uh, Kyle Larson he ended up winning after being out Tyler Reddick and Ryan Blaney. And I will say this: you would think Reddick would be the disappointed one at the finish because he's shown a lot of disappointment. But he actually said in this post race interview he was actually satisfied. Meanwhile, Ryan Blaney is the one down and angry and probably needs the HL treatment there. <laughs> well, one, Reddick actually showed some speed. That was evident. Like you and I were saying before the show, he wasn't as fast as Larson, but he was definitely the next fastest car um, at the end of the race anyway. Blaney was not on the right tires and, and had a whole bunch of headaches in front of him. And I think his was more, he felt like he didn't control his own destiny. Luck played a role when Brad darted off the track moved up Larson. So now Larson has the inside lane. They're coming to the green flag. I'm not even going to discuss the restart because all the numbers showed it was as fair as fair could be. There was yeah, the restart. It was. Blaney, Blaney had the high side. And look, for you kids watching at home, what Larson did there, entering one, that's what a good race car driver does. He pinched, he pinched, he pinched. He forced Blaney to enter higher than he wanted. Didn't get into him. Just kept robbing his line to set himself up and go. That's how you race. That that is racing. That's that's the he didn't get into him. He didn't bump him. He didn't do any of that. So, hack tip to Larson there. Um I'm going to give myself a pat on the back because Sean, I put in our Discord channel, I'm all in on Larson and Reddick this week. I gave four bets, but I said I'm all in on Larson and Reddick. These are the four and I can't complain when they went one two. I'm just also going to mention this too, but remember the last episode when I mentioned he was going to be running the same paint scheme as he oh, did yes, for the double. Yes, and then you were like, yeah. that's it. Bet the paint scheme. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> should have listened to you. Rich. <laughs> well, the thing was, is NASCAR story betting works, Sean, right? He did get to run the Coke 600. He did run Indy. It had a little disappointment with the pit stop penalty. He had more seat time at that track than anyone else. They brought the same paint scheme back that was supposed to be run at Coke and at Indy. Like, there was so much. And you even said it. It almost seemed like NASCAR didn't want the late caution to fly because they wanted Larson to win. The story was there, right? I mean. Yeah, it was. You When you brought up the whole paint scheme thing, you completed the whole, the whole deal, dude. It went full circle. You, like, put the final piece of the puzzle in. Yeah, because that day, until we recorded that episode, you had no idea he was running that paint scheme. I didn't. Zero. Zero. And as soon as you said that, I'm like, sold! And it worked. It worked. If you we bet a better. lot on Larson, you would have been having a lot of money by now. But there you yeah, go. Yeah, because he was plus 700 earlier in the week. That's true. Very, very true. But, you know, uh, all... Uh, all talk of the finish aside, it all got set up because Kyle Busch fumbled away a potential good finish with two to go trying to overtake Denny Hamlin. Right when He's Brad Keselowski was trying to save fuel from the lead, staying ahead of Blaney and Larson. But, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that Busch still ended up having a better finish than Hamlin, who was involved in the final wreck of the race there, Rich. That was interesting. And you could just tell Busch is trying too hard. That's all that was. That was Busch trying too hard. Yeah, pretty much. But you know what? How about 2311 Racing? Both of their cars ended up in the top five there. We mentioned Reddick in the second position. And then we have Bubba Wallace finishing in the fifth position. A great run for Bubba there, Rich. And you called it. You said watch out for Bubba. You loved him as one of your long shots. I pushed him as a top 10 bet. Wish I would have pushed him as a top five. Um, yeah, that was an excellent call by you, Sean. Yeah, great call out there and you know it, it this is why it pays to listen to the thunder hour when we get the our bets going for the week sometimes so there you go 
speaking of uh, bets, but rather, well, betting is in DFS go hand in hand. I'm okay. I'm just trying to segue this. This isn't working. Top place differential plays of the week there, Rich. Uh, no, it did work because we pushed Cedric as a top 10 bet and he moved up 31 positions from 38th to seventh. Uh, me and Kenobi were talking because I was like, I, you know, he's like, you don't like Cedric. It's not that I didn't like Cedric. It's just, I wasn't sure what to do. Well, then when he qualified so far back, he was so chalky, you know, with the practice times. And it was like, then I'm like, Kenobi, I can't even build a lineup without him because of his price and, and potential place differential. I mean, he was, he was a lock. So Kenobi, you were ahead of me on that hat tip to you, sir. There you go. But, you know, he earned so many more positions that in order to go towards the driver that's second on the list of most positions gained, you go from 31 all the way to 18. And that was three different drivers getting that. Todd Gilliland was the best finisher of the three. He started 24th, ended up finishing in the sixth position. Carson Hosevar, he started 30th, ended up finishing 12th. And then Cody Ware started 36th, ended up finishing 18th there, Rich. I guess he decided to stop hitting and start driving cars now. I don't know. Whew. Whew. That's spicy right there to mention there, Rich. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't have a lot of patience for that stuff. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Daniel Suarez was next with 17 places. And hey, another hat, another pat for me. I pushed Todd Gilliland. We had a whole discussion on Todd Gilliland, if I recall, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, the Todd father, man. He just the is Todd back father. In the game. I like that. We're going to run with the Todd father. I like that. Well, that's what people online have been calling him, too. So I like it a lot, too. All right. <laughs> we'll Todd run with father. It. The Todd father. Meanwhile, some of our favorites that we liked, both William Byron and Denny Hamlin, bit us, bit us bad with William yeah. Byron losing 34 positions, caught up in a wreck. He was fast till he got in the wreck. Hamlin was fast till he got in the wreck. He finished 30 positions further back, uh, finishing 32nd after starting outside pole. Um, this one shocked me. Joey Logano what and A.J. Allmendinger, after Dinger had that great run in Xfinity, both Joey and Dinger finished 22 positions further back than where they started, both finishing back in 34th and 37th. Yeah, there, I tell you what, there was a lot more wrecks this year. I didn't hate it. I did. Yeah. I thought we got the race broke up well. We had some hard racing. Honestly, I was fine with the racing content at the Brickyard this year. I know people were still bitching that it was boring. I thought it was a good race for the most part. It was. It was. It certainly was there, Rich. Uh, stage winners. Denny Hamlin won the first stage, so at least he didn't leave with nothing. And then Bubba Wallace won the second stage, which, like Ryan Sieg and Xfinity, this was huge for Bubba and Cup, especially now with him being involved in that playoff battle there, Rich. For sure, that's big. Um, lap leaders, I'm not even going to give how many they led just because uh, it, it was all over the place. But we had Tyler Reddick leading the most. Brad Keselowski was right there at the end until the whole fuel thing came into play. That was going to be fun to watch it play out. Yeah, That's my only I beef with the Kyle Busch. Right? I wanted. I have no problem watching him run out on the backstretch and seeing Blaney go by and Larson running him down. Like We were going to see a show is what was going to happen. Um, oh, yeah. I 100% Wallace, agree. Bubba Wallace led the third most laps. Hat tip to Bubba. Denny Hamlin was next. John Hunter Nemechek leading some laps, Sean. Yeah, 16 laps there with JHN. But, you know, at one point before he decided to pit for fuel, it looked like he was in contention to win one of the stages. So it did. he's been showing some speed there. He has. And, and I'm going to have to start giving Legacy a little more love because the soccer club is starting to look a lot better and their owner is starting to be a little more honest about reality. So... So I'll start to give a little love to legacy here. I was going to say, are you, instead of soccer club, are you just going to call them legacy club? Give them one of the words back. <laughs> we'll call them legacy for right now. We haven't quite got to the motor club part, but we'll give them legacy for right now. <laughs> fair um, enough. Ross Chast fair enough. Ross Chastain and Kyle Larson and Kyle Bush all led a few laps. Chastain with eight, Larson with eight, Bush with five. Larson led the most important ones. Noah Gregson was up front for a few. Christopher Bell was in the top five for most of the day, led a couple. Chase Elliott led one. McDowell led one. And the Todd father led one. Um, Christopher Bell did have a solid finish in fourth. Nothing overly exciting. Hat tip to Noah Gregson having a nice bounce back finish after a tough go the week before. He finished ninth. Uh, I had higher expectations for Chase Elliott in 10th. 
Stenhouse just missing out on a top 10. He had a nice run, though. Yep. Nice run for Stenhouse and a lot of place differential gain, too, for him. Yeah, because he started 20. Was he 22nd? He was definitely in the 20s. I don't remember the exact position off yeah. the top of my head, but there you go. Uh, Austin Dillon, 13th. Corey LaJoy, he better get his finishes while he can. Uh, Ross Chastain, a little disappointing at 15th. McDowell, I think, was a little disappointing in 16th. Zane Smith, not bad there in 17th. Ty Dillon. Yes. Not Austin Dillon. Ty Dillon. I get it's just inside the top 20, but. He, he took that RCR equipment, got a top 20 out of it. I know he didn't beat Austin. There was a lot of talk about Ty Dillon in the Discord this week. He did at least somewhat pay off there. He got positive place differential in the top 20. For the price, worked out. It worked out. J Justin Haley, 20th. Uh, Brad K ended up finishing 21st after really being a top five car all day. Chris Buescher finished 22nd. Ty Gibbs, 23rd. Um, they, they've, they've got some motor problems going on over there with the uh, Ty Gibbs team. They, they, there was something else they were fighting during the race I heard them talking about. I think they got it fixed, but they definitely had some challenges. MTJ had a rough day in 27th. He uh, Didn't he spin twice? Didn't he spin and then make get back into the top 10 and then get spun again? Yeah, and then the second time he got damaged, which prevented him from really making any further moves up the field. Yeah. So that was weird though, because he spun, it had to go to the back, obviously, and fought his like next thing I know, I'm like, he's in the top ten again. Uh Alex Bowman, rough day at 31st. Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy. Man, Jimmy. J Jimmy, just put somebody else in the car instead of you, bud. Because you're not you're not helping. You you're not giving good notes. You're not helping. Well, credit where credit is due to Jimmy, though, this time, because he at least was driving that car inside to the top 15 before he basically got involved in that mess that was caused by Carson That's Postcar true. and Logano. You're right. Correct. You're right. So I should pump credit the brakes where credit a little is bit. That, you're right. I should pump the brakes a he, little bit. He was running a little bit better than average. Well, now that we've done the recap, we've already kind of uh, hinted at it, did a little foreshadowing. Let's talk about the biggest news of the week that dropped last week, Sean. Yeah, the biggest news so far during this break, Corey LaJoy and Spire Motorsports will part ways after the 2024 season. This is just crazy just because it was just about two, three weeks ago when they first signed Rodney Childers when they were also saying that they were excited to work with Corey, see how well he can do, and then not even a full month later, they're saying, oh, yeah, Corey's out of the car now. So we're getting somebody else. But was it even two weeks? There was like two races after they said that, and then he gone. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you wonder if, uh, especially because there was a lot of social media backlash towards Corey LaJoy within those last two races. Makes you wonder if maybe Spire was looking at that and was being like, I don't know. I don't know. You know. Maybe sponsors won't like that. Well, I was going to say, is it sponsors or was it the new crew chief that's like, yeah, that's not going to be how that's going to fly. Because, you know, this whole Kyle hooked himself. It was it, this came out of nowhere and it wasn't long after the whole Kyle hooked himself. And then he doubled down on it. Yeah, not a good look. Not I was going to say at all. Maybe maybe that's playing into it a little bit. Because if you look at who Rodney Childers, it's not like Harvick is Mr. Clean, don't get me wrong. But Harvick calls it like he sees it. And when he's done screwed up, he said it. Or he said, you know, this guy was driving like this and I did this and this goes back to this. Corey was just like, yeah, he just screwed up. You're talking about Kyle Busch here, bud. Like you, I don't know if Kyle Busch should let you hold his jock strap, and you're saying stuff like that. So, you know, I don't know. Because I, I made the comment to someone, I wondered if part of the deal with Rodney Childers is he was going to get to say on the driver. And maybe makes that's why he was like, it makes you wonder. And may, maybe he wanted to see what he had. And then after that, it's kind of like, you know, we got some young talent I think I'd rather work with. Yeah. So speaking of talent, how about we uh, speculate a little bit? Who do you think is going to get the number seven Chevrolet now, Rich? I am really stumped on that. I'll, I'll be completely frank because I'm trying to think of who I could see Kyle Bush. I don't know that his contract is up, but I could see Kyle Bush with the truck relationship with Spire and the Xfinity and all of that. 
and the frustrations that have come, I could see that being a thing. But I, you tell me, Sean, because I I have been racking my brain going, you know, I'm, I'm also biased. I keep saying I want to see Heim get an opportunity. But I, who you got, man? So really, if you ask me, I'm not sure if Kyle Busch is 100% going to be the driver, especially when he has one more year with his RCR contract. Now, there is an option. It's an option that RCR can take. And if RCR decides to say no to Kyle being there another year, which I definitely think they're not going to do unless they're getting going to unless Spire's going to buy out Kyle Busch. I would say pay something for it. Yeah. Yeah. So really, you got to think of other drivers out there. I think there's the potential that maybe Zane Smith could return to the, the team, even though they said he was going to be gone. Maybe they, they could work another deal with Trackhouse in order to get him for another year. There's uh, Sam Mayer is definitely in the conversation as well, as I've been hearing, as well as Christian Eckes as well. Both of those Which, two dr- drivers. I, in the Sam, Chevy Mayer, Sam Mayer has a little hat Kevin Harvick to him. So that that is the one young name that has kind of been floating in my mind is Sam Mayer because I feel like he has a similar driving style to Harvick, um, kind of similar approach. A young Harvick reminds me of a current Sam Mayer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so. I, I get what you mean there, Rich. I can see it a little bit myself. Now, here's some out-of-the-box thinking, but you know we still don't even know about the whole track house situation for next no. year. No. Which, so, time out, time out. Did you hear the nonsense going on with the whole battle between Trackhouse and Stuart Haas? Oh, uh, I don't think I was aware of this. Uh, do enlighten me. Maybe I'm getting it confused with 2311. It's either Trackhouse or 2311 that they're, they're, for lack of a better term, I'm calling it a stalemate over discussions of buying the charter. Really? Let me see. Go on with your thought. Let me see if I can find it. Cause I, when I came across it, I meant to send it to you and I did Sean. So, so continue on. Let me see if I can find it for you. Okay. So overall, Sam Mayer and Christian Eckes, they're both a part of the Chevy fold there as mentioned, but as far as track house is concerned, there are some interesting things that still haven't been settled. I think one of the more interesting things that people haven't been bringing up is the fact that Daniel Suarez's contract is not set in stone for next year. Oh. Even, though, even though he has a win, he's going to be in the playoffs. We know that Ross Chastain is probably going to be the only driver that's stick it, definitely sticking around with track house for at least next year. But Daniel Suarez a while back said the contract talks are going well. He expects to be signed soon, but he said that months ago there, Rich. We don't even know if Suarez now at this point, considering he's been kind of underwhelming overall outside of the win, if he's even going to be, be signed into an extension at Trackhouse. Maybe they could work a deal where maybe he'll just go over to Spire for a year or something like that. It, it's possible, but either that or maybe we might see something uh, similar to what happened with Zane Smith this year where Trackhouse loans a driver out to Spire. And maybe that could be the way that SVG gets it. Well, there is a lot of talk with the SVG. I mean, I, I got to believe SVG has got to ride. Especially if Trackhouse is looking to have Zane Smith join into the main team itself. Because remember, Zane Smith is a Trackhouse contracted driver. Right. Whatever is right. going to happen with Zane, they got to go through Trackhouse to do it. All right. So the log jam, the stalemate, all these articles go back to May. What's interestingly enough is I found an article from May 10 talking about them buying a charter discreetly from Stuart Haas before the whole Stuart Haas announcement was made later on, two weeks later in May. So all I can say is this. There is something going on with, with the purchasing of the said charters. I could be wrong, but I'm guessing both 2311 and Trackhouse are not willing to get in bidding wards and drive the price up. And this is causing some sort of stalemate. But it is what it is. Um, Sean, you just went through a whole bunch of scenarios. I really don't know which way it goes. And and now the yeah. Spire 7 ride opening up, it does change things. Because four years ago, I would tell you nobody would want that ride. Today, I think it could be a hot commodity. They've shown enough speed the last two years, and we've seen enough with this car, with Trackhouse and 2311 hitting the ground running, so to speak. 
I don't see any reason why when you know you're getting Rodney Childers and some of his staff, for lack of a better term, yeah, that that's not a hot commodity in the garage. And, you know, speaking of some of his staff, which used to drive at Stuart Haas, there's one more name that I've heard might be under consideration, too. Ryan Priest. Really? Yeah. Just because we know that uh, Priest has the Stuart Haas connection there overall. Uh, even though he hasn't directly worked with Rodney Childers, we know Priest is still looking for a ride. And his name has been floating around the discussion potentially as maybe a more uh, driver with experience that the team might be considering, too. And, and I think they should get one with experience. I think that would help more than anything, especially if you want to get the team to take the next step. Just put Childers with an experienced driver. Where refresh my memories. Does Noah Gregson have a spot? He does. He's going to front row next year. Okay. Okay. So he does have a spot then. Um, it's interesting about Priest. I mean, I, I had higher expectations for Priest this year. I really did. And and I'd been fine with Barry going over there, but we know that's not happening. So um it's gonna be interesting here. I mean, we're gonna have to start hearing some dominoes fall sooner than later because Sean, we're, what, four races away from the playoffs starting? Yeah, exactly four races. And, uh, you know, we still we don't even know about Corey LaJoy, but I have a particular guest that I think is a little bit interesting, too, when you think about it. it. I think that if there's going to be any t- chance that Corey LaJoy is going to remain in Cup, I think he's going to join Colic. Uh, I can totally see that. And you know, my reasoning for it too is not just the fact that that Colic has two seats and one of them is just filled with multiple drivers, but I think there's a sponsorship connection that people are not talking about too because LaJoy has been sponsored by Celsius. Celsius. They're, they're a Colic sponsor that usually sponsors uh, some of the Colic cars, but most notably with AJ Allmendinger. And Dinger's going full time Xfinity next year, right? We don't know. Oh, I thought I read that somewhere. Okay. So that's not official. If I did read it, it's not official by any means. They have not um, said officially where Dinger is going to be next year, if it's going to be Cup or Xfinity, but he is expected to remain with Colleague in some form. Okay. I think he's. I think he should go back to Xfinity personally. He put him – he's fine. He's good enough. I, I don't want to dog on him, but the dude was, like, dominant in Xfinity. There's nothing wrong with having guys dominant. Just an all guy I don't think is ever going to be a cup driver on a regular basis. You know what I mean? And I I look at if I were them, you still get to drive full time and have a career of it. No, you're not going to make the millions and millions of, uh, you know, that the cup guys do. But um, so what else you got here on, on 2311 here, Sean? So this one just came out very recently, but 2311 on their social media channels, they basically released a teaser video saying that one driver is going to end up driving the number 50 car for one more race this year. So I actually grabbed a quick screenshot here of the driver in question from the video. And this is what was shown. They, they were oh, my showing- God, that is totally Juan Pablo. Yeah. He's Looks even like- got the man boobs. <laughs> there you go. But uh, yeah, a lot of people are saying this is Juan Pablo Montoya. 2311 should make an announcement soon. But if you if we do think this is Juan Pablo Montoya, which track do you think he's going to end up racing on? Because we know he's a former cup driver, as it is, Rich. Let's see. I got to believe they'll put him on a road course. So, what, Watkins Glen coming up? We have Watkins Glen and the Charlotte Roval as the only remaining road course races this year. I don't think it would be a Roval. I could be wrong. So, my money would be Watkins Glen or I can't, nah, I can't do it. I can't see him going back to Daytona. Yeah, if if he ends up going back to Daytona, we're going to start to see all the jet dryer memes come up again. <laughs> I mean, and, and he used to be fast. In all fairness to Juan Pablo, he he would be fast. He just overdrove the car all the time. He drove beyond the car. I mean, I, I remember I got a group of fans thinking I was psychic at Charlotte one year because I called the lap at which he was going to crash the wall and the lap at which he was going to start running the high line in turns one and two or three and four. I can't remember which way they did it back then. Um 
and and then he did it during the race and the people thought i was some sort of psychic it was hilarious man this is crazy but you know uh out of all the potential names they could get in order to drive the 50 car though juan pablo was definitely not the one i was expecting no if, if it ends up being juan pablo no who else is tan with gray hair man and man boobs I'm only saying that for the benefit of the doubt there, just in case that, on the off chance it isn't. That's it's fair. Just I'm just else, saying but. I can't I can't think of anybody else with that build, the gray hair and the dark, dark complexion. Like I can't. I can't think of anyone else. I really do think it's probably gonna be Juan Pablo, but you know. Just can never be too sure because this has just been a wild year with unexpected driver announcements as it is too. So there you go. All right. Well, it is what it is. We'll find out. It, it, I got to tell you, Sean, though, with us only being four, four races away from the playoffs, this silly season is dragged out. I mean, usually by now, by the time we get to August, we have most of the teams for next year kind of lined up. Dude, we got question marks all over the place. I don't know what's happening yeah. with Kyle Busch. We don't know what's happening with the seven. We don't know what's happening with, with track house technically yet or 2311 with third cars we got to believe svg's in the fold somewhere but to what degree we don't know and what does that do to about five other drivers i mean it and we still don't have one of the front row seats settled yet too agreed and that 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 charter was announced a month and a half ago or whatever so and and we know the Stuart haas guys have been given free reign so three out of four of them have found rides ryan priest is the only one that hasn't yet Right. And then we've got those sponsorship thing I know is a problem. But I mean, we've had Heim's name, Herb's name. We've got Mayor's name coming up now. Priest, who's already in Cup. Custer's coming up, we know. Um, Eckes, Eckes has got his name out there as well. I mean, I just want some answers, Sean. Just answers. You know, a part of me wonders if maybe the reason we're not seeing the answers is because some of these teams are waiting on the charter agreement in order to be finalized. And that still isn't finalized yet. Finalized? I don't think they're anywhere closer to where they've been. I'm just saying, I was just trying to be kind there and, you know. (laughs) I'll be the bad guy. I'll be the bad guy. (laughs) They're nowhere near. We, We still have a bunch of people butt heads on that whole deal. And the fact is, is where the sticking points are, from my understanding, neither side wants to move on. So, you know, we're used to seeing this in stick and ball, strike, lockout, whatever it was. I mean, we've seen both, and there is a distinct difference. I don't see that happening here. I don't see drivers striking or teams striking, and I don't think NASCAR will lock them out because NASCAR will take whoever is willing to drive. I mean, we've seen this with the tire wars and all the other stuff going back into history. So... But, Sean, I mean, if there's no guarantee on what the payment's going to be, how do you put vehicles out on the track? Are you just going to race for prize money each week and call it a day like we used to? I guess either that or NASCAR is going to make up their own teams and just put whoever they can get in them. I don't know. (laughs) Right. I'm at a complete loss, man. I I really am. I I don't know what to make of this either. I don't really. I don't. This is just we shouldn't be talking about silly season when we're about to kick off for football, I guess, is my thought. Like, you know, the last final pieces, I get it. But, Sean, we're talking major pieces here. I, I yeah. Don't. Got some Cup Series seats and some of which could actually end up being competitive in a year or two. So, Well, nobody gave Trackhouse an inkling of a thought two years ago, right? They, now, granted, they haven't been as successful recently, but you know as well as I do, racing is cyclical. You hit on something, and then other people catch up, and then you got to play catch up again. And, you know, I, they may have gotten caught being complacent. You know, even when Hendrick has been down, I know those guys haven't been complacent. They're chasing. Maybe partly the reason Trackhouse got a little behind was being complacent. But, look, Colic has shown speed at times. Spire has shown speed at times. This car has definitely leveled the playing field as far as that goes. So you're right. This is, there's some big pieces here and some very, again, I go back to, all right, Sean, I'm coming to you. Do you, do you care if it's Spire, Front Row, or Hendrick, if I tell you, you get to work with Rodney Childers? 
if you get to work with Ronnie Chillers, you've got to take that opportunity. He he's one of the best minds in the garage as it is. He Period. knows how to read and analyze data. Whatever team he's a part of, he's going to make it better. And especially if Spire ends up eventually, maybe say giving him a competition role. We saw what uh, what Hendrick did when they promoted Chad Knauss to a, 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 a technical role there too, and now we see all the Hendrick cars looking about as fast as they've ever been pretty much. And all the drivers Agreed. there are still young. They, they can be successful for years to come still. Well, and you brought up a good point because it was not uncommon at Hendrick where two of the cars would be. And I still say we have seen more speed out of the 24 five garage than we have seen out of the nine and the 48 garage. I think I have the teams right on that one. Um, do I, I, I know they're, I know they've got I two in the one so. garage. I, I, but anyway, it sure seems if you look at qualifying finishes, I'm not talking finishes, but if you look at practice times, qualifying times, all that, the 24 and the five have historically been faster than the nine and the 48. And it's historically always been that way. In fact, that poor, it's now the five again or the nine again, but the team that used to be the 25 and then the 88, they were always, always just a little bit behind the rest. Since Chad got put in that role, it's definitely been much more uniform. And I'm not shocked, right? I mean, I heard for this from guys in the garage years ago. They're all getting, you know, other teams can buy Hendrick chassis and stuff. But it's what Chad Knauss did with that same chassis versus what Rodney Childers does with that chassis versus Alan Gustafson or, and so on and so forth. And now you've got that guy kind of overseeing everything. And honestly, you saw that with um, Joe Gibbs racing at one point with uh, Greg Zipidelli. Yeah, pretty much. That was the years when uh, Tony Stewart was still driving for the team, I want to say. Right. right? Right. Yep. So. All right. Um, well, we we just said we're four races away from the playoffs, so we should highlight the playoffs here a little bit. Um, yeah, let's let's have a little fun and talk the playoff picture to close out the show here, Rich. Uh, so as we know, we have 16 drivers that can make the playoffs in the Cup Series every year. 12 drivers are currently in on wins. Kyle Larson with four. Denny Hamlin, William Byron, and Christopher Bell all have three. Ryan Blaney is two. And then we have a bunch of one race winners here with Chase Elliott, Tyler Reddick, Brad Keselowski, Alex Bowman, Joey Logano, Daniel Suarez, and Austin Sindrick. So that's 12 drivers in on wins. We have four more that can get in on points. And currently, that's Martin Truex Jr. in the 13th spot. He's 108 above the cut line. 14th is Ty Gibbs. He's 42 above the cut line. Chris Buescher is 15th. He's 17 above the cut line. It matches his number. And uh, Ross Chastain is the last driver currently in. He is seven points to the good there, Rich. Yep, and we're going to definitely see a shakeup. Those on the outside looking in, Bubba Wallace, obviously. Uh, he's knocking on the door. He's seven points out. Chase Briscoe's a ways back at 83. Kyle Busch, this is bad, man. I don't, I don't see him. He's going to have to get a win. And, and I'd rather see him get the win for the streak anyway, but he's 112 points back. I mean, for all intents and purposes, Sean, that's three races. Yeah, pretty much. The maximum amount of points you can obtain in a race is 60 points. But to do that, you'd have to win both stages and win the entire race. So realistically, right. I mean, I'm just saying this. Realistically, I think the points battle is just between Ross and Bubba and Chris Buescher overall. Chase Briscoe could probably sneak his way in if these drivers all have incidents for maybe a race or two, and he has two really good days. But other than that, I think anybody else, you know, further below Briscoe, like Kyle Busch on back, you're looking at a situation where they might have to win in order to get in. I, I think so. I think so. So the four races left before the playoffs, we got Richmond, which we're going to have that option tire. I'm curious to see how this works out. Everybody seems to think it'll be different this time around. I don't know. Uh, Michigan, calm down, everyone. I know it turns into a boring fuel mileage race. I kind of dig the strategy. It's going to be a lot like Pocono. Um, Daytona, wild card, and at least we finish on a real track at Darlington. Yeah, we thanks to the whole Olympic break, uh, the, the scheduling of these races had to be shuffled around, and so Darlington's now the cutoff race instead of Daytona like the past few years. I know NASCAR wasn't exactly a fan of that move because they like the wild the wild card that is Daytona to close out the regular season. But, you know, it's cool to see Darlington go out there and be that last race. Yep, I agree. Well, if you like the show, 
please click. Go up to fantasyguru.com, click subscribe, sign up for the all in, leave a comment, subscribe here. We're going to have you covered. Sean, Sean's going to be doing most of the legwork here as football season gets going because I am stretched thin and I apologize. Um, I'm just not good enough to do this full time per se. So I, I've got my day job and uh, I, I'm running low on daylight hours. But Sean, who is the man, the myth, the legend on NASCAR, long before I ever even sniffed a thought of guru sean was leading people to the paydays in the nascar circles at fantasyguru.com so i can't thank sean enough but we will continue the nascar breakdowns and the thoughts and everything else and cheat sheets going forward we both have uh, posted a little thought in discord so if you are a subscriber and member of fantasy guru guru.com go over to the discord check out the nascar channel we got you all filled in there sean nitty gritty time man we got a month left and then it's the playoffs yeah, that's right. Uh, so who do we predict is going to end up making the uh, playoffs here, Rich? Who do you think that gets the last four spots? I do think Truex Gibbs get in. Um, who? I, I'm i going to go with Ross Chastain and Bubba Wallace get in over Chris Buescher. Interesting. I think it's going to be Chris Buescher and Bubba Wallace getting in over Ross Chastain. Interesting. I can dig it. I wouldn't mind seeing that, to be honest. So, Well, on behalf of FantasyGuru.com, on behalf of Sean Angle, please go to his Twitter account and follow him at SeanE247. You can find me on Twitter at FantasyBosco.com. This has been the Race Guru Thunder Hour, brought to you by the Elite Plus Net Network. Until next time, peace. Mm-hmm. <laughs>